We thank you, God, for blessing us with another day. We ask, Lord God, that those that are coming, Lord God, you allow them to make it here safely. Help us all to make it home safely this evening. Lord, just open our hearts and our minds to your word tonight, Lord God, as our pastor brings forth the word, as we break down the word, Lord God, just illuminate our hearts and just let us grow spiritually, Lord God, from what we learn. We thank you so much, Lord God, for this opportunity, and we, we bless your name. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Glory to God. Good evening. How's everybody doing? All right. Y'all ready to get in the Word? Praise God. Book of John. Wonderful book. Book written so that you may believe, so that you may have, have confidence in Christ Jesus and who He is and what He's done for you. It's, it's the book that emphasizes that Christ Jesus is the Son of God. He is, he is deity. He is, he is uh, the supernatural uh, Christ that God has, has spoken of from ages past, and now he's here, and he's showing by the things that he does that he is the Christ come to save us from our sins. So praise God. It's a wonderful book. We're in John chapter 5. We'll pick up, of course, where we left off. We go verse by verse. We left off at verse 23 here, actually 22. It says, For the Father judges no man. This is Jesus speaking. For the Father judges no man, but has committed all judgment unto the Son. Verse 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father. He has, he that honors not the Son, honors not the Father, which he has, which has sent him. So here we, we, Jesus is talking and, and, and saying, all authority to judge on earth has been given unto me. So not just what he, he saw during his, his ministry, but he's talking about all judgment. There's coming a judgment for all of us where we will all stand before the judgment seat of Christ and, and get rewards for the things that we've done uh, in this life when we've done what God told us to do, when we obeyed God and for those things that we didn't do when we should have done something, we will lose out. So there's a judgment seat for the believer. And then there's coming the final judgment, the great white throne judgment at the end of your Bible in the book of Revelation. And uh, the great white throne judgment is also uh, executed by Jesus Christ. He is the one that will judge mankind. For Jesus said, all authority in heaven and earth has been given unto me. So he is the one that has the authority from the Father to execute judgment in the earth. Because he, he came down as, as a man. And as a man, he has authority in the earth to judge mankind. So he is the judge. Uh, it says in Revelation 3.21, Jesus said, I am set down with my Father in his throne. And then Revelation 7.15 says this, He that sits on the throne shall dwell among them. So it's very clear that Jesus sits in the throne of the Father. With the Father, in the Father, they are one. And so he is the one that is, is going to execute judgment at the great white throne judgment. Now there's, there's two uh, judgments. Like I said, there's the judgment seat of Christ and then the final one, which is uh, going to be the judgment of the dead, the spiritually dead. And we'll get to that a little bit later tonight. But it's going to be executed uh, by Jesus Christ. But then he says that all men should honor the Son even as... They honor the Father. Now, he's talking to the Jews when he said that. That is a staggering statement. <laughs> you are supposed to honor the Son. He's, he's the Son even as you honor the Father. That's, a, that's like a flat-out statement saying, I am equal with God. Jesus is co-equal with the Father. All, all three, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are co-equal. Okay? So even as you honor the Father, you are to honor the Son. That is a staggering thought. Jesus is saying he is God. He is deity. So when you reject the Son, you actually are rejecting the Father. And if you reject the Father, you're rejecting the Son. For they are one and the same. When you've seen the Son, you've seen the Father, right? 
So this is a, a, an amazing statement that proves the deity of Christ. This, this is very important because there are so many religions out there that believe in Jesus, but, but they don't believe Jesus is God. They don't believe in his deity. Islam believes in Jesus. They, they believe the same, supposedly, the same Jesus that you do. It's not really, but anyway. <laughs> they, they believe in a, in a Jesus. I think they call him Isa. But it's not our Jesus. It's not the Jesus of the Bible, really, because our Jesus is God. And they don't believe Jesus is God. The Jehovah's Witnesses, they don't believe Jesus is God. So there's cults out there. There's all kinds of religions out there that, that uh, uh, respect Jesus as a, a good man or a prophet of God or, or some great person, but they don't believe he's God. You don't believe he's God. You don't believe the Bible. <laughs> the Bible is crystal clear. Jesus is God, the creator, and, of course, our Savior. So we are to honor him even as we honor the Father. He that honors not the Son honors not the Father which hath sent him. And this is a major point that Jesus keeps pointing out. You are to honor the Father who sent Jesus. So you've got to realize that God Almighty sent Jesus. He keeps repeating this point over and over, and we'll see it again uh, a little bit later on. This is so important because you have to realize that, or they were supposed to realize Jesus is the Christ. He's the one sent from God, sent from heaven, all right? So there, you got to keep in mind that the Jews were, were looking for hundreds and hundreds of years, maybe even thousands of years, close to 2,000 years, looking for the coming one, the Messiah, the Christ. And, and, and he's showing up and saying, I'm here. <laughs> and so you have to believe that he is the one. He's the one sent from the Father. Verse 24, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that hears my word, he that hears my word and believes on him that sent me has everlasting life and, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Spiritual death that all mankind is under unto spiritual life. So he starts off, verily, verily, this is a phrase that you'll see only in the book of John. Uh, we might translate it, truly, truly. He's making a strong emphasis on what he's about to say. Truly, truly, I say unto you, hear, he that hears my word. So he's giving two conditions, basically telling them how to be saved. You have to believe the word of Jesus Christ and believe on him that sent me. In particular, you got to believe that God sent me. God sent Jesus Christ. He is the Christ. So you have to believe the word and you have to believe that Jesus was sent by God. So these are the two things that the Jews refused to believe. They didn't believe a thing Jesus had to say. And they sure didn't want to believe that he was sent by God. Why? Well, that would mean that they're out of power. They're removed from power. You know, you ever put somebody in power, they don't ever want to get out, right? Power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. So if the Christ shows up, King and Lord of all, now, uh-oh, we have to go because everybody's going to follow him. And so, of course, there was, there was that, that jealousy that if he's telling the truth, then the Christ has arrived and men will follow him instead of following us. So, of course, they were religious. And so they relished in men following them and men looking up to them and, and honoring them and loving them and, and seeing them as, as so great and so spiritual, so pious and, and, and wanting to be like them. So uh, there was a great conflict when the Christ shows up. So there's two things. You have to believe the word and you have to believe that Jesus is sent by God. This is how we have everlasting life, okay? Not just life that lives forever. It's talking about real spiritual life. How is everlasting life defined? It's defined by knowing Jesus and knowing God. In fact, I might have that scripture handy. John 17, 2 and 3 says this, as you have given him power over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And this is life eternal. This is how you define eternal life. It's not how long you live. You know, even, even Hitler, who's probably burning in hell for all of eternity and eventually the lake of fire, he's living forever. So it's not duration of life. This is eternal life that they might know thee, 
the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. So this is the definition of eternal life, is knowing God and knowing the Father, God, and Jesus Christ. And this person that has everlasting life shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. Spiritual death, which every human being, every man on the earth has ever, that's ever walked the earth is in a place of spiritual death, and they pass unto spiritual life by their faith in uh, God's Word and in Christ Jesus. Verse 25, verily, verily, I say unto you, the hour is coming and now is when the dead shall hear the voice of the Son of God and they that hear shall live. So this really has a, a twofold meaning. Uh, uh, first, of course, we can, we can see that Jesus is prophesying about a resurrection. Uh, the Jews believed that a resurrection was coming, and Jesus was saying, yes, there is a resurrection coming where those that are dead in the graves, bodily speaking, will rise from the graves. But then this is also a, a double meaning that there's uh, the real resurrection is actually spiritual. In other words, these men, and even us today, on the earth, when they hear the gospel of Jesus Christ, they're hearing the good news and being resurrected spiritually. Okay? They're, they're hearing that Jesus is the, the Lord and the Savior of all mankind. And if you will believe, you will be saved. That means resurrected from a place of spiritual death to a place of spiritual life. A place of spiritual darkness where you don't know God to a place of spiritual life where you know God the Father and you know Jesus Christ whom God the Father has sent. So it's a double meaning. And they that hear shall live. Praise God. In verse 26, it says, For as the Father has life in himself, so has he given to the Son to have life in himself. Again, again, this is co-equal with the Father. Verse 27, And has given him authority to execute judgment also, because he is the Son of Man. All right, so... Uh, it, all life comes from God. All life comes from the Father. All life comes from the Son as well. Okay? So, again, he's, he's equal with the Father. If you honor the Father, you're, honor, you're going to honor the Son. If you honor the Son, you are honoring the Father. So, as the Father has life in himself, so has he given the Son to have life in himself. 1 John five eleven says this, and this is the record that God has given to us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He that has the Son has life, and he that has not the Son has not life. So there is no life except through Jesus Christ. And has given him authority to execute judgment also because he is the Son of Man, because he was, he was uh, the one that God sent to the earth to become a man. So now he has authority on the earth as a man. You know, that authority came all the way back in the book of Genesis. When, when God created man, he gave him dominion and authority over the whole earth. And the man was supposed to uh, uh, come under the lordship of the Father God and submit the whole earth to God. All right? So uh, Adam failed at that. The last Adam, Jesus Christ, he is the last Adam. There's not coming another Adam. So you're either under the first Adam or the last Adam. You're, and so being under the last Adam, hallelujah, all authority was given unto him so that he could execute judgment in the earth because he's the son of man. And then he says to his disciples, marvel not at this. Apparently his, his disciples were gobsmacked. They were, their jaws were open. Oh, Wow. And so he said, don't marvel at this. For the hour is coming in which all that are in the graves shall hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or condemnation. <laughs> so not only does he say, don't marvel at this, then he, he kind of doubles down and, and blows their mind even farther. He says that... All that are in the graves are going to hear the voice of the Son of God and shall come forth. 
And so this is true. There's, there's two resurrections, and we'll, we'll show it here in just a second. So there's two resurrections. There's the first one and uh, the last one. The first one is the resurrection of the church, what we know as the rapture and resurrection. And then there's the last uh, resurrection at the end. Uh, but let me just, we'll come back to that. And they shall come forth, they that have done good unto the resurrection of life. Okay? So once uh, your name is, is, is in the book, the Lamb's book of life, you will be resurrected unto life eternal with God. Never leaving Jesus' uh, side. You will always be with him. He will always be with you. And they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation or condemnation, which ultimately is the lake of fire. So we have a little illustration. So the, there's the first resurrection, which uh, we know of, and then there's the second resurrection. And there's a gap of time between the two of them. The first resurrection is also the rapture. So the dead in Christ shall rise first, then those of us that are still on the earth and, and, and alive will, will look up and, and uh, the Lord will, will call from heaven and, and we'll be with him in the uh, rapture. So we will be changed, be made uh, uh, with our new glorious bodies. So that's the first resurrection uh, and rapture. That's one event, resurrection and rapture. It's one event. Then following that, we will, we will be judged at the judgment seat of Christ. That's only for the church. That's not for the dead. And then there's going to be a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ. The millennial reign of Jesus Christ or the, or, or the reign of peace of Jesus Christ is going to last a thousand years. That's the thousand years that the, the devil, Satan, is going to be bound uh, in the bottomless pit. He's going to be chained for a thousand years, and I believe him and all his demons are going to be bound, and, and so that's why it's, it's going to be awfully wonderful, awfully peaceful <laughs> to have those demons and, and the devil bound up. So there will be a thousand-year reign of Jesus Christ on the earth. He will rule from Jerusalem, and we will rule with him, those that overcome. So the first resurrection, then a thousand years, and then the second resurrection. This is the, the last resurrection. This is the one where the dead are going to hear the voice of God. So all will hear the voice of God, Jesus. All will hear the voice of Jesus. And those that are at the second resurrection, the majority of them are going to be uh, the dead. Now you understand that during the thousand year reign of Jesus Christ, people can still sin and they can even still die. So there's going to be just like there are today, there's going to be the godly and the ungodly. But at this second resurrection, everybody left over, basically, you could say, is going to be resurrected. Those that have done good will get reward and eternity. Uh, and there will be a new heaven and a new earth that they will live in. And those that have done evil, well, they stand before God. If their names are not written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that's when they're thrown into the lake of fire where the devil, the false prophet, and the Antichrist are going to be for all of eternity. I think that's it, yeah. Verse 30, Jesus is still talking. He says, I can of mine own self do nothing. As I hear, I judge, and my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father that has sent me. That's the, the distinction of Jesus' ministry is he's always seeking the Father's will. Praise God. And so that, and, and, and in the same way that he was always doing the will of the Father, seeking the will of the Father, you know, he was always in prayer. That's how he could hear the will of the Father. But we too are to seek the will of God. We are to seek the will of Jesus Christ. For we are an extension of him in the earth. Of course, he's the head and he's in heaven. We are his body. We're on the earth and we're to be doing uh, the work of Jesus Christ, continuing the ministry of Jesus Christ, right? Okay? destroying the works of the devil, preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. So if, if Jesus completely depended on God, how much more, of course, shall we and our weakness and shortcomings depend completely on God and on the Spirit of God to carry out the ministry that we have on the earth? So we, of course, can do nothing of ourselves as, as well. So we are, like Jesus, supposed to hear from heaven and execute the will of God. In this case, uh, as I hear, I judge. So Jesus is bringing up his judgment. Of course, we talked about earlier, he is the judge. And he says his judgment is just or righteous 
because he's not seeking his own will. He's seeking the Father's will. But the will of the Father which hath sent me. Un unfortunately, there's uh, too many ministers or people that claim to be Christians. They're, they're not seeking God's will. And so they're uh, poor witnesses of Jesus Christ. They are not faithful witnesses. We all want to be faithful. The only way to be faithful is to seek God's will. So if, if, if you're not seeking God's will, you're, you're not building God's kingdom. You're building your own kingdom. And so sadly, there are too many ministries out there that are not seeking God's will, and they're, they're, they're seeking their own will and building their own kingdom. Hallelujah. But we are to build the will, uh, build the kingdom of God by following only God's will. Paul said it this way, I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ. And so we are to seek, of course, the will of Jesus Christ, the will of the Father. Verse 31, he said this, If I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. There's another that bears witness of me, and I know that the witness which he witnesses of me is true. You sent unto John, and he bears witness unto the truth. All right, so there's a, there's a lot here. So he's saying, uh, if I bear witness of myself, my witness is not true. What, what he's saying is basically, if I bear witness of myself, only if I'm the only one bearing witness, then it's not true. That, the word true uh, it doesn't mean that what he's saying is not true. What, what he means is it, he, he's going back to uh, Deuteronomy. In fact, you can look it up, Deuteronomy 19.15. It says, In the mouth of two or three witnesses shall every word be established. So you can't just have the testimony of one person for it to be valid. So he's saying when, it, when I bear witness of myself and my witness is not true, he's basically saying it's not established on enough evidence to prove to be true. Okay. So he's saying, if I just did it by myself, and he is giving witness of himself. In fact, it says that in John 8, 18. I am one that bears witness of myself, and the Father that sent me bears witness of me. So he did give witness of himself, but he didn't want you to stand on that alone. He goes on to cite three more witnesses to prove that he is the Christ, the Son of God, sent from heaven. And he starts right here, you sent unto John. So John was the first witness that, that Jesus cites. Okay, so John the Baptist. Uh, and later on, we'll read it in verse 36. Uh, uh, Jesus then says, uh, another witness is the Father's, uh, hold on, is the miracles. The, the, the miracles, the works that I do, they are witness. And that's in verse 36. And there's, then verse 37 talks about, and the Father gives witness as well. So Jesus gives three witnesses to say that he is the Christ, the Son of God. So uh, in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. Well, Jesus was, was uh, very well established. In uh, John 10, 12, it says, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. So Jesus always pointed to the works that he did that gave witness that he is who he said he was. Read verse 34. But I received not testimony from man. So he just said, he just mentioned John, John the Baptist. And he's basically saying, I don't need, I didn't need approval from John the Baptist. You needed it. He says, I received not testimony from man, talking about John the Baptist, but these things I say that you might be saved. So he didn't need John the Baptist. Uh, he, he wasn't looking for approval from John the Baptist or any man whatsoever. He didn't, want, he didn't care about if anybody acknowledged him, if anybody approved of him, if anybody liked him or didn't like him. That had no bearing on him. He, he couldn't care less about what people thought about him, whether, whether uh, men honored him or not. He was seeking not the honor of men, but the honor of God. But he goes on to say, uh, you know, J John was sent for your sake. So you can believe and, and understand John was prophesied to be the forerunner of Jesus Christ. So now that he's come, you should have listened to him. He's the number one witness, the first witness. He was a burning light and a shining, he was a burning and a shining light. And you are willing for a season to rejoice 
and his light. Now, John was uh, not the light. He, he was a light. Of course, Jesus is the light. That's what it says in John 1.8. It says, John was not the light, but he was sent to bear witness of the light. Okay? So, Jesus is the light, and we all are a light. We're not the light. We're a light that's, the, that's sent to bear witness of the light, Jesus Christ. That's, all, that's what we're all called to do. So they rejoiced. They rejoiced in John. Uh, uh, one reason they rejoiced, because John was a prophet. And they hadn't seen a prophet in hundreds of years. They've been waiting for a man of God, a prophet, to show up. And, and finally, there's one. It, it was clearly John was a prophet. So they rejoiced in John. And, and, and they, they liked him. He was, he was just another man. He, but, but here's the thing. They didn't rejoice when Jesus finally showed up. They didn't rejoice in the Christ. Well, why wouldn't they rejoice in the Christ? You know, they, they searched the scripture looking for the Christ. Well, again, we're talking about the, the religious Jews, the Pharisees, the scribes, and, and Sadducees. These guys did not rejoice when Jesus showed up. Because, again, it, it takes away their power. They, if it, because Jesus is the Christ, he is also the King of kings and Lord of lords. Well, if the king shows up, your power is gone. He automatically gets all power, all authority, all rule. Everyone must submit and follow him. And that's the thing that determines really whether you are, uh, in our case, a Christian or not. See, every, everybody likes the idea of, of religion. Man is, man is a very re religious creature. He likes the idea of doing good and, and being a good person and a moral person and, and, and even the idea of going to church and, and helping people and serving people and the, the intellectual stimulation of, of scriptures. And, 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 and you, can, you can seek all these things but still not seek God, still hate God. So man has that tendency to, to seek all this religious stuff. And it's not just the Christian religion. In all religions, they, they fulfill or they attempt to fulfill all these things. Emotional connection and, and social justice and social good and, and moral uprightness and all these things. But they, they, that don't mean they have any idea who God is. They don't know God whatsoever. Okay, there has to be something very particular that you have to do, and that is to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You have to say, my life is now yours, God. My life is not my own. You are Lord. I choose to lay down my life and say, not my will be done. I'm not going to do my thing. I want to do your will from now on. And of course, that's where the rub is. That's what determines a Christian. A Christian is not just somebody that says, I'm a Christian. I go to church and I'm a Christian. I, you know, I might even prayed the prayer and so forth. But it's the person that does what they say they believe. Faith without works, right? All right, so this is the challenge. They, uh, they rejoiced at John, but they didn't want to see Jesus Christ because he'll take away their authority. Verse 36, but I have a greater witness than that of John. So he cites John. Then he says, here's a greater witness for the works which I do. With the, for, with the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do bear witness of me. Okay, so the works that he did, the miracles, the signs, the wonders, the, you know, the healings and, and destroying the, the, the devil and the things that he did, these bear witness of him. And really, that's the work of the Holy Spirit. That's the work of the Holy Ghost. That's the endorsement of God on him. Okay? So this is where Jesus seeks his approval. It's from heaven. Not John, not men. This is where he gets his approval. This is the one he counted on. Uh, and the Father himself. He gives the works. The second one he gives is the Father himself bears witness. The Father himself, which has sent me, has borne witness of me. Has borne, past tense. So he's talking about the scriptures. Has borne witness of me. Then he says, but you've never heard, you've neither heard his voice at any time, nor seen his shape. In other words, they didn't know God at all. They would study the scripture diligently, daily, memorizing it. But there was a vast difference between what they had in their head 
and truly knowing God in their heart. They did not know God in their heart because they wouldn't humble themselves to receive. And it's evident by, you know, how they treated Jesus and how they rejected his word and did not believe him. And that's the case he's making here. So, so, and, and, and so the Father himself has sent me, has borne witness of me. So we have the, the witness of the works that he did and the witness of the Father uh, in scriptures. And, and all throughout scriptures, of course, uh, uh, Jesus was attested to, was, was uh, proven to be the Christ. There's uh, the, the Levitical law pointed to Jesus, the feast days, the sacrifices, the, the Passover uh, celebration, the tabernacle, and all its furnishings. All these things pointed to Jesus. Every single page of your Bible points to Jesus Christ. He is the central figure of the entire book. So, it also says, go back to, let's go to the next verse. And you, talking about the the leaders of the Jews, you have not his word abiding in you. For whom he has sent him you believe not. Search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life and they are they which testify of me. Okay. He, he, I mean, this is so offensive to the Jews. He's basically telling them, these people that stu- study the Scripture nonstop all the time, you don't have God's Word in you. What do you mean I don't have God's Word in you? I, I've memorized it. No, you don't have any of it in you. He said it very clearly. Again, the, the vast difference between in, in your head and in your heart. You don't have God's Word in you. How did he know this? For they didn't believe Jesus. They didn't follow Jesus. They didn't accept Jesus. So, uh, and then he, he told them, go ahead and search the scriptures. If you have a humble heart and you search the scriptures out of humility, looking for the truth, God will reveal himself to you. But if you're just seeking the, 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 the following of men, which is what they were seeking after, you'll never see the truth. The, the book, the Bible will be a, a completely closed book. To someone like that, whose heart is not open to the things of God, who is not humble, who is not seeking for truth. You know, I, I also used to go online and, and talk to people about Jesus and talk to the atheists and go back and forth and, and all these things. And, and, and they would claim, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm seeking the truth. But the fact was they weren't because the moment I told them the truth, they rejected it. Okay, this is proof right here that that logic is, is true. If they were truly seeking the truth, they would receive the word of God. But they're not seeking the truth. You have not the word abiding in you because you've rejected him, God, whom God has sent. So they thought that they had eternal life in the scriptures. And the eternal life was Jesus Christ himself standing right before them and they rejected him. Let's keep going. Verse 40. And you will not come to me, that you might have life. This, this is really a tragic prophecy. He's prophesying not only of what's happening at the moment, but the Jewish nation as a whole rejected Jesus Christ. And so the, they were uh, basically destroyed, annihilated in, in the year 70, 70 AD. So you will not come to me. Jesus knew it all along, that you might have life. John uh, 319 says this, and this is the condemnation, that light is coming to the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. So, you will not come to me that you might have life. I receive not honor from men, but I know you, that you have not the love of God in you. Okay? So, uh, this was the, the essence of these, these spiritual leaders. They were always seeking honor from men. And that's why they never found God. They never had God's word abiding in them. They didn't know the truth. The, God could show up right in front of them and they would completely not see him. <laughs> right? They did. Why? Because they were seeking the honor of men. The, the, the honor of men is a very poor uh, counterfeit to the honor of God. Isn't it? Uh, the, we we want to be seen by men. We want to be heard by men. This is the nature of all mankind. 
You can see it when, when you know, people do the selfies and get the likes on the social media today. They're seeking approval of men, the likes of men, literally, the likes of men. So we, we, but it, it, that's just one example. There's, it's all across the, uh, every spectrum of the human race. They're seeking, man wants honor from men. You, it's basically one or the other. Either you, you can get honor from men or honor from God. Not really, you, you can't have both at the same time. Are you seeking the honor that comes from the Father? You know, and, and it's, it's not wrong for men to honor men, you know. Even the Bible teaches us to, to honor those that, are, that honor is due. But here's the thing is, you know, if, if, for example, you're, you, you want to honor someone that's blessed you, maybe someone in ministry that's ministered to you and helped you, and, you, you know, you appreciate them and say thank you and so forth. That is good, and that is right. Because you're not really honoring the man. You're honoring what God has done through them. And if that person receives that honor, then they are taking honor that belongs to God. So us, like in my case, as, as a minister of the gospel, I don't receive any honor. Not, man should never, ever receive honor from other men. Now, men should give other men honor. There's nothing wrong with that. But should I receive it? No. I am supposed to give it all back. I give it all to God. Thank you, Jesus. You're the one that did anything good through my life, anything beneficial. We are only a, like a conduit. The glory passes right through us and goes right to God the Father, right to Jesus Christ. We... So it's good and right to honor men, but when you receive it, it's like a trap. If you go, yeah, look, look how spiritual I am. Look how much Bible knowledge I have. Look at all these, these you know, things I've done for God. You, you make yourself, I mean, you make yourself the enemy of God that way. That's, that's stealing honor that belongs to Jesus Christ. So never take honor that belongs to God. Always pass it on. Say, all that I did was only because of Jesus. I have nothing good in me. I am nothing. I can do nothing. I have nothing. There is nothing in me. All honor must go to Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Never hold God's honor. Give it. Never receive honor from men. Men will honor you, and that's fine, but you, you, you let it pass right through you and go right to Jesus Christ. Then he says, but I know you that you have not the love of God in you. First John 4, 8 says this, He that loves, knows, that loves not knows not God, for God is love. So this is the litmus test. Are you truly in God? If you are, love will be part of your normal life, your everyday walk. And of course, it should be for us. Let me keep going. Uh, verse 43, I, I am come in my Father's name. And you receive me not. But if another shall come in his own name, him will you receive. And this is, I believe, a prophecy about the Antichrist, really. There's, there's coming the, the man of sin, whom the world, the Jews included, are going to receive. And he's going to come in his own name. And they will receive him. Verse 44, how can you believe which receive honor from one another. So he's, he's still talking about the subject of, of honor, the honor of men. He says you can't, even, you can't even believe in God because you're seeking the honor of men. A person that's, that's seeking the honor from men doesn't even have faith in God. How can you believe, which receive honor one from another, and seek not the honor that comes from God only? All of us should only be seeking the honor that comes from God. Never look at, oh, is everybody liking me? Is everybody loving me? Am I making everybody happy? Never look down on men. Always look up to heaven. God, am I doing your will? Am I pleasing you? I'm seeking the honor that comes from you. Because man's honor, again, it's a very, very poor counterfeit. Seek the honor that comes from God only. Do not think that I will accuse you to the Father. There is one that accuses you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Okay? So, of course, they were, they were all big on Moses. And so the scriptures spoke of Jesus Christ in the books of Moses, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, the, the Pentateuch, the Torah. The, you know, in Genesis, Jesus was, was prophesied. He was the, 
uh, the seed of woman, the, the, the snake crusher to crush the, the snake's head. You know, um, in uh, Numbers, he was that, that snake on the pole that healed everyone that, that looked at him. He was the star of Jacob. Uh, in Deuteronomy, he was the prophet that is to come, that is uh, one of you, one of your brethren. So Moses spoke of Jesus, and they refused to hear the word because they didn't have the word in them. There has to be, you can't just, just hear and, and, and read your Bible. There has to come a, an illumination of God's spirit. Or the, or the word can be completely dead to you, com, completely dark and have no meaning. You've got to have the Holy Spirit to help you understand and see scriptures. Okay? So they had a, a ton of knowledge in their head, but they had no revelation, no, no, no rhema word, no spoken word to their heart by the Holy Spirit. It's only by the, the Word and the Spirit that you actually have the Word of God. Uh, the, 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 the letter without the Spirit is death. It doesn't help you at all. It actually kills you. But the Word and the Spirit together, the illumination comes. You have revelation knowledge. And you can only get that when you humble yourself to receive. When your heart is open. Like the, the, the parable of the sower, the seed is sown in the ground. The ground is your heart. When your heart is open and humble, ready to receive, then you can hear the word of God and receive and bring forth fruit. So you had, uh, for, uh, verse 46, for had you believed Moses, you would have believed me. For he wrote of me, like I just said earlier. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? All right, then. Chapter 6, I'm going to get through a little bit of this. I still have time. All right, so after these things, after Jesus had spoken to these, these Jewish people, that, these Jewish leaders, scribes, Pharisees, whoever they were, uh, uh, after these things, Jesus went over the Sea of Galilee, which is the Sea of Tiberias, and a great multitude followed him. And this is kind of neat. This is kind of a picture of, of the gospel and so we'll get into it in just a minute. And a great multitude followed him because they saw his miracles, which he did on them that were diseased. Of course, he healed uh, uh, multiple people. So they're, they're seeking after uh, uh, the, the things that he can do for, him, for them. They're, they're seeking the benefits of faith. They're not necessarily seeking God. Jesus went up into a mountain, and there he sat with his disciples. See, uh, the... It, you know, God can do miracles. We can see healings and miracles and things happen. And thank God for that. But, but the, just what you see is not the highest type of faith. If you only believe because you've seen something, that doesn't mean you, you, you have the, the highest type of faith. The highest type of faith is you uh, hear the word of God and you believe it. You don't have to see anything. You don't have to feel anything. Just because God said it, you believe it. And that's what God is looking for. That's the highest type of faith. But these people were following Jesus because, well, what can he do for me? Can he heal me? Can he, can he bless me? Can he, in this case, can he feed me? <laughs> so, uh, verse 4, And the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. And when Jesus then lifted up his eyes and saw a great company come unto him, he said unto Philip, Whence shall we buy bread that these may eat? Okay? So, uh, there was a great company, we, you know, it says in, in another place that it was about 5,000 men, which equals to anywhere from 10 to 15,000 people if you include women and children. So most scholars believe there's at least 10 to 15,000 people out there that are following Jesus. So this was a great company of people. And so what does he do? He, he asked Philip a question. Where are, are we going uh, where, where are we going to buy bread that these can eat? And Philip uh, answers from, from really a, a natural, a carnal perspective. But Jesus said this to prove him, to test him. That word uh, prove is parezo, which means to test. So he, he was testing him. And, and here's Philip's response. And, and, well, let me get, for he himself knew what he would do. Jesus knew what he was going to do. He was going to multiply the food. But Philip answered and said, 200 penny worth of bread is not sufficient for them that every one of them may take a little. He was, he was, Jesus was making a point, the natural is insufficient. And us in the natural, with our natural uh, uh, reasoning, when we are faced with a problem, 
You know, we're, we're probably very much like Philip. How much is it going to cost us? Naturally, we think of how much money is this going to cost? But when you look at the supernatural, there, there's infinite supply, right? There's no lack at all when we, when we receive some or, 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 or give something in the natural. We've, we've lost that amount that we've given. It's, it's gone from us. <laughs> but when it comes to spiritual things, we can give and it multiplies. Things from heaven multiply. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's when you know you've got something spiritual is you never lose it. It actually multiplies. So he said this to prove him. Of course, uh, Philip is thinking naturally, we don't have enough food. We don't have enough, uh, I'm sorry, enough money to buy food from, for all these people, nearly 10 to 15,000 people. One of his disciples, Andrew, which is his brother, Simon's, Simon Peter's brother, said unto him, there is a lad here which has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? Okay, so uh, again, thinking naturally, there's always insufficiency. When you look to the natural, the natural is never enough. You got to look to the spiritual, to the supernatural, to Jesus. And Jesus said, make them, make the men sit down. Now there was much grass in that place, so the men sat down and number about 5,000, 5,000 men Plus, there's women and children, so there's, there's a lot more people out there, okay? So this is, uh, this is a neat picture. Well, you know, Jesus is going to take these loaves, the, the bread. We understand that Jesus is the, the bread from heaven. In the Old Testament, you know, they, they had bread from heaven, manna from heaven. It represents Jesus coming from heaven. It represents the Word of God coming from heaven. And so in the Old Testament, that bread came from heaven, and, and, and they would... Uh, uh, they were supposed to enter the promised land. The bread would come from heaven to feed them every day, and they were going to enter the promised land, but they didn't have faith. But anyway, they, so in the Old Testament, they uh, uh, marched around, you know, in the desert for 40 years, bread from heaven. But they were, it, it represents the Old Testament law. They were always working. They were always working. But here we see in the New Testament a picture of rest. Jesus tells them to sit down. To rest. This is going to come from heaven. You don't have to do anything to get it. You don't have to work for it. So the Old Testament represents works and law. The New, Tepper, New Testament represents resting in God's grace and the supernatural. And Jesus said, make the men sit down. So they sat down, about 5,000. And Jesus took the loaves. And when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples, disciples to them that were set down and Likewise of the fishes as much as they would. As much as they would. That means they could have all they wanted to eat. It was a buffet, man. You could eat as much as you want till you got full. They had plenty. All right? So, and this is, this is a neat little picture where, where uh, Jesus really, in the New Testament, Jesus is the bread from heaven. And he was uh, broken, you know. It says... Uh, Took the loaves when he had given thanks, he distributed to the disciples. But the bread was broken by men on that cross. Men, uh, of course, crucified Jesus, or he laid down his life, I should say. And then he was distributed to the disciples and the disciples to the world. So this is kind of a neat little picture there. And so they had as much as they could. And when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with fragments of the five barley loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So these weren't, you know, the, the fish bones. They, they had 12 baskets of more fish and more bread somehow, uh, through a miracle, of course. And so uh, they gathered that nothing be lost. So this is also a neat picture that there were 12 baskets. Well, there were 12 disciples. So each, each disciple got blessed by doing this ministry and they got their own basket to take home. Maybe they could feed their family with this. But in a sense, these, these, these very baskets that they would carry uh, represented them. These baskets, they had received the word from heaven. They had received Jesus Christ and then they were going to distribute it to the world. And so here we are 2,000 years later because of the ministry of Jesus Christ Next to the disciples, we, hallelujah, have Jesus Christ. We have the Word of God. We, we have the things of God. So uh, they were faithful in ministry. At least 11 out of the 12 were. And then 
Another one was added later, one of the uh, other last disciples, because Judas uh, gave up uh, his estate. And those men, when they had seen the miracle that Jesus did, said, this is of a truth that a prophet should come into the world. Okay? So these people saw the miracles. They, they, they followed him in the first place because they saw the miracles of him healing. And now he provides food. Well, this is awesome. You know? And, and unfortunately, this is kind of a, a picture of, of how the gospel is often presented is all the benefits. And, and the benefits are good. We, sh we should mention absolutely the benefits. God will bless you. He'll provide your needs and so forth. God, you know, take care of your, your needs. Take care of your food. He'll, he'll, but that's all that they were seeking him for. They were seeking him ju just for what he has in his hand, not seeking him for who he is. There has to be a full gospel presented. Uh, just the benefits, just the blessings, bless me, bless me, bless me gospel is not the full gospel. There also has to be a gospel that says, but you also have to submit to the lordship of Jesus Christ. You have to obey him. You have to turn from the world, turn from sin and follow him. You have to give up your life for if you save your life, you'll lose it. But if you lose your life, for his sake, you'll gain it. So that's the whole thing. We, it's, all, it's easy to preach the bless me, bless me, bless me side. And unfortunately, there's been just a little bit too much of that at times. Uh, but there has to be a balance. There, this, this, this is good. Thank God for the blessings of God. But, and the healings and the miracles and the, and the provisions. And, and all those things are wonderful and true. But there has to be the heart of the matter is seeking God. Truly knowing God. Not just what he can do for you. But you know, what, who he is, the heart of the Father, is knowing God. Eternal life is knowing God and knowing Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And so when Jesus there, therefore perceived that they would come, and they're going to take him by force and make him the king, this, this was a, a natural reaction, of course. Uh, he's the prophet of God. We're going to make him a king. And so we can throw off the shackles of the, the, the Ro Roman government who's, who's kept us... Uh, occupied our land all these years so they're going to make him king but it's out of god's timing i mean they were they were right he's the king he's the christ he's the lord but there's also a matter of timing involved which they didn't understand and of course the father kept that kept the timing in his own hands and so he departed to the mountain himself alone it's kind of a picture of him returning back to heaven and i'm going to stop there uh, at verse 15, next week we'll pick up, not next week, actually next week we're going to have laity, but the week after we'll pick up at uh, chap, uh, John chapter 6, verse 16. So next week come out and support our laity to laity service. We're not going to have a webcast, but those in the house are going to be able to enjoy our laity service. And with that, I will stop and hand it over. We are so glad you were a part of the service today. We trust God has ministered to your heart through today's teaching. Our ministry is supported 100% through donations from people like you. Please consider supporting Christ Unveiled Ministries by going to the bottom of ChristUnveiled.org and clicking the Donate button. Your donation will help us reach around the world with the gospel of Jesus Christ. To watch more sermons like this, select Resources, then Sermons Archive. God bless, and we will see you next time.